So thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited to get started and, to, and I wanna first introduce you to our board. For me, our board is obviously a source of governance, but more importantly, I rely on our board for guidance, for advice, for ideas, creativity, and just diversity of thought, as it happens uh, that when you sometimes get stuck in your own, own bubble, it really helps to have folks from other parts um, of, of work that we do that can help us to help to guide us. So I'm grateful to have this amazing group of talented and experienced leaders to help us on our journey. Uh, so I want to introduce them. So first, I'm going to jump in to say Keith Raboy, who's the, he joined our board from the very start. He is a general partner at Founders Fund. His background is full of tremendous successes, leading investments like DoorDash and ThoughtSpot and Stripe, to name only a few. He also took early stakes in YouTube and Palantir, Lyft, Airbnb, Eventbrite, Wish, and Quora. And Keith founded Open Door, which I'm sure you've recently seen lots of news about, which transforms the process of building and selling homes. He has a unique and unparalleled track record as an entrepreneur, an executive, and an investor. And over the last decade, he's forged several of the most important social and commerce platforms. One of the things that many might not know about him, but which I think is interesting given our panel, is earlier in his career, Keith was a litigator at the Wall Street law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell. So thank you, Keith, for being here. Uh, next, I wanna introduce Lynn Hua Wu, who is the Chief Communications Officer at Dropbox. Lynn is the, uh, where she oversees global and ex internal and external communications, brand marketing, and analyst relations. She sits on the company's executive staff and is a board member of the Dropbox Foundation. Previously, she was head of corporate communications at Square and a partner at Brunswick Group and Kext and Company, firms which specialize in financial and crisis communications. She began her career also as an associate at Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich and Rosati in Palo Alto, and she serves on boards at Glide Memorial and, of course, the Stellar Development Foundation. So thank you, Lynn. And then Ronaldo Limos, who is a lawyer specializing in technology intellectual property, media, and public policy. He's a partner at Reno Pentado Advogados and has 20 years of experience in the private and public sector. Dr. Lemos was uh, a visiting scholar at Oxford, Princeton, the MIT Media Lab, and a visiting professor at the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. He also co-created, and this is where I met Ronaldo actually, Brazil's Internet Bill of Rights Law in 2014 and Brazil's National IoT Plan in 2018 and he served on the boards of the Mozilla Foundation, Access Now, and other for-profit and non-profit organizations. And finally, last but not least, we have Jed McCaleb, who is our co-founder and chief architect. He is also the chair of the SDF board. And uh, I just have to say that Jed's devoted his career to developing and leveraging technology that promotes inclusion and transparency. So thank you to all of you for being here with us. Um, I, today we'll be talking about network effects. Uh, when it comes to growth models, there are two primary ones. There's linear growth and then there's network effects. Whereas linear growth is self-explanatory, network effects uh, is something that, you know, we, uh, excuse me one second. Network effects is, um, it results in exponential growth because the business offers a product service that grows more valuable as more people use it. So network effects takes into account the usage of the product and the growth of an ecosystem or a support system around that product and service. So we'll be discussing network effects broadly and then within the context of blockchain and more specifically in the context of an open network. And not surprisingly, this is something that's actually really important to us here at the Stellar Development Foundation and something important to blockchain and Stellar specifically. All right, so I'm gonna jump into it. And I'm going to ask, what are the upsides and downsides of network effects? And I'm going to hand it over to Keith and see if we can hear from you first. Well, the upsides you already alluded to, which are, you know, exponential growth, which, you know, starting something from scratch basically has to confront inertia. So when you start something from scratch, there really isn't anything. And the faster you get momentum on your side, the more chance you have of changing the world. The downside is, of course, if you scale really fast, if there's anything that's not uh, polished, 
it just magnifies problems. So for example, if your marginal economics don't work, meaning you lose more money on every transaction that you make, the faster you grow, the faster you run out of money. Or let's say you have a lot of customer support issues. Like, so the product isn't very elegant or intuitive. The faster you grow, the more you daily lose your team before they can actually fix it or before you can hire people appropriately to respond. So basically it's just a, a magnification and when things are going really well, magnification is great, but if you amplify things when they're not perfect, you tend to you know, create real problems for yourself. So I think those are the, the two big, the biggest upside and the biggest concern. Yeah, that, that, I think that's true. Now, now, Lynn, in your experience, like obviously with something like Square and even with Dropbox, network effects is a really important piece. So what, what has your experience been with this? I, I would say plus one to what he said is the foundation needs to be there. And if you are profitable and your margins look good, then the network effects is just gonna make things explode. And you still have to keep up with the increased demand, but to the extent there are cracks in this system, those are gonna become pretty, pretty apparent and you're gonna to have to struggle very, very quickly to figure them out. It's, a, it's obviously a good problem to have. I'd, I'd rather have that problem than the other, but there, there are downsides. And there's also you know, just general supply issues if you are a retail, uh, outlet or if you're selling something, right? Or if you, you see an increased demand because of this network that's been built and you need all this potential that's there. Like, I think it's a, it's a you, you really need to keep up with, with the want and the needs of consumers and that can be a great challenge. Just one to follow up on that, Lynn, like in your experience, has it been that the communications and the brand marketing and everything that you've done, has that really in, increased the network effects opportunity or how has that, how has that affected it? Yeah, I think that it, you know, when I think about, you know, how do you know when it's the right time to sort of help to scale a team, for example, when you're doing communications and brand marketing, I mean, there's resource constraints, but the network effects are going to increase the need for reactive communications always, right? Because you do see, there will always be cracks and things that you need to work out. And then you see this tremendous opportunity um, that you're not always able to take advantage quickly enough, right? There are stories to be told, there's markets to be um, where awareness needs to be raised. So it's, it's always a push and a pull because there will be the reactive things that you need on the messaging side, but then there's these opportunities you really want to take advantage of. And Jed, every business that you have, or every company that you have founded, I think has been heavily reliant on network effects. How has that uh, impacted yeah, totally. your work? Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with what everyone has just said. I mean, I think the one thing I'd add is like, in the early stages, if it, depending on what the product is, and I think this is particularly true of crypto, is that it kind of works against you in the sense that unless you have this critical mass of people or this like kernel of activity, like the, the product is just not that useful. And so you, you do need some way of bridging that gap and like getting to the stage where there are there is enough people where the network effects can kind of take off. And I think this is kind of the thing that's been help holding crypto back for, for these years. I mean, everyone's very interested in it, but like to getting the actual number of people actually using it has been, has been slow. And I think it's because of this. We haven't really bridged the gap, the gap for like the critical level of, of use yet. So. And Ronaldo, what role can network effects play in developing countries and for financial inclusion? Well, I think uh, from the perspective of financial inclusion, Danelle, this is something we, we actually really need. So as you know, uh, a large portion of people in the developing world do not have bank accounts. So they do not enjoy any sort of uh, network effects that are beneficiary or that can cause positive externalities for them and the way that they basically access uh, either financial services or public services in general. So this is something that is very much needed. And in the case of Brazil, there is one uh, interesting case study going on right now, which is the fact that the Brazilian central bank has just deployed a uh, national tool for payments that basically zero the cost for people to send money to each other. And this has been happening in the past two days. And as of uh, right now, 10 million people have already enrolled in the system in two days. And this is the sort of thing that I think demonstrates that people are really eager to have uh, better platforms, platforms that are multi-purpose and platforms in which you can build things on top of them. So that, I think that, that shows that, for instance, for Stellar, uh, that builds uh, similar multi-purpose applications that have to do with financial inclusion, there is a huge opportunity there. 
That's, uh, I mean, I think that that's what we're seeing as we just see things start to move with these kinds of, um, when you have more players building with more creativity on the network, you see more opportunity for this kind of growth. Um, Lynn, achieving network effects is all about getting to like some sort of critical mass in both supply and demand. So how do you know when it's the right time to grow and scale your business? I think that there's some markers you can set along the way, right? Which is you've overachieved your, um, well, first of all, you don't have the enough supply. That should, that's an obvious one, but there are other things internally when you've hit targets and you've overachieved them pretty easily. I think part of it is when things feel like they're in control, like risks are essentially mitigated and you have some structures in place. But to me, the biggest sign is really when you can't chase down the opportunities, right? When things are, sort of at a stable place and you see all of these opportunities, your consumers, um, your partners are asking for and you're not able to, uh, to, to service that. So to me, that's a sign that you should think about growing and starting to scale your business because you really want to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. And when that, does that mean also like, so when you say growing, that means like growing your employee base, it's also growing your maybe geographic reach or any yeah. of those kinds of things? I think G G markets like geographies like maybe adjacencies and that may come a little bit later but certainly starting out with just your team and who can who can build the products who can service them right all of the ecosystem in, within your company that needs to to help with that so i'd say team geography certain products or features maybe that you're launching in the case of dropbox it's always when you're looking at metadata and you see how people are using our product there may be some some things you're seeing where, where we don't have a feature or product to actually service that and that will help inform the road and Keith, um, in your previous experience, and also somewhat in the current one that you're working through, how do you build that user trust and that enthusiasm for relatively, like what we would call nascent technology, uh, especially when so many of the services that deal with, they're dealing with sensitive information, um, like value, or like your open door experience recently? Yeah, that's a great question, because in financial services and in healthcare, there's an there's a amplification of this problem, which is credibility. At the end of the day, you're trusting someone with your money or your health. And when you start something from scratch, it may be in fact better, but convincing people that it's better is part of the art. So a couple of sort of tactics that have worked is one is you borrow other people's credibility. You may have partners that have a brand that you can leverage. And so you work with them and infuse your, your product and service with credibility. Secondly, I think design matters. Um, the precision and polish of a product speaks to credibility. So when someone's taking care and sweating about all the details, it gives you more confidence in using a new product and service. Sometimes you can actually develop marketing data before you even launch. Like, so for example, you've done an alpha or beta experiment with a set of customers and proven that the product is better in some dimension or some dimensions, and you can market that before you start. But this is a, a classic challenge. Um, at Open Door, in the beginning, the first few weeks, we actually had a real trouble of we were sending offers to people in Phoenix and no one believed they were going to get their money. They were just like, they would they'd basically Google the name of the company. They couldn't find any content or very limited content. And so they were concerned that the, like this you know, $234,000 wasn't going to get wires for their account. Obviously, with some time and some you know, press, but we focused actually on using the media. So the media can be a good, a, a good uh, hack around the system is... People believe if they whether or not they should, but they do believe if they've read about you in like Forbes or Fortune or the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal that you must be a real company. Um, and then another classic uh, sort of trick uh, is actually people believe that companies that advertise on TV are more credible. Um, <laughs> that may be an artifact of history of just like the expense of advertising on TV back when there was a few networks and not that many choices. Um, sort of it guaranteed that you have a, a fair amount of you know uh, dollars in your balance sheet. Um, but there's still a little bit of halo from TV advertising. Um, those are most of the tactics that I've learned over the years. That's fascinating. Not surprising, I think. And Ronaldo, just just piggybacking on that, I, I, what I feel like uh, sometimes we don't take into consideration enough when we're trying to create that trust and that credibility is the geographic differences and the trust that's created and the and the the, the cultural differences, even like trusting government or trusting financial services companies. I think we encounter that. Uh, certainly when people are using new financial service applications in different countries, it's, it may, they may have a different trust vector um, with respect to that because of their experience. So is that something that you've seen in, um, in Brazil and elsewhere? 
Oh, yes, absolutely. So what, one of the challenges is that uh, in the developing world, in many of the countries, or maybe most of them, people do not trust their incumbent services as they are right now. So they do not trust their, their local currency. They might not trust their, their banks. They don't want to put the money uh, in their banks because they think that the banks will charge them with uh, monthly fees that are prohibitive, especially if you don't make uh, much money, as is the case of most of the people in the developing world. So there is a, a lack of trust in, in the local incumbent services. And I think like uh, new applications that basically provide uh, alternatives to those systems and are built in uh, what we can call trustless trust. So that's the case for blockchain applications, for instance. They, they are actually uh, one way to go. And, and that's why I think like a, a, a very minor technological development as the one that Brazil Central Bank put together uh, in the past two days caused like this massive uh, turnout because this is not a mandatory application. People can subscribe to it only voluntarily because they want to. So if people see that there is an opportunity to keep their currency stable or to keep uh, better financial services that do not uh, tax on them in terms of fees all the time, and these rules are clear, transparent, they will jump into those. And that's what we are seeing like in this interesting minor specific case in Brazil. And I think that shows that there is a, a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, I guess it's that old security model, the trust but verify so that you can trust us, but you can also verify it. And that's something that we definitely try to use in blockchain and certainly here at, at um, SDF. But Lynn, how do you get to the place where you can use your messaging for user trust in your marketing materials? Like how do you convince users through messaging to be able to trust you? Well, first of all, I want to say thanks, Keith. I loved Keith's plug for TV advertising because it's always a constant struggle to get the CFO to agree <laughs> to allocate dollars to top of funnel brand marketing spend. And these things are very expensive. So maybe there is some truth. If you have enough money to do the TV advertising, you must be somewhat of a legit <laughs> entity. Um, I, I think that to me, marketing and user messaging is, it really has to be, what, what I would call, it's, it's a little bit jargony, but earned, owned, and paid, right? So it's the channels of, of not just um, paid marketing, but it's earned, right? So what you would pitch to a Forbes or Fortune, and it's also your own channels that you're, you're putting out yourself. And I think the world is becoming much more of an owned media world where you can actually help shape your brand, build credibility with your users, build awareness of your products and what you stand for, because I do think that everything you're putting out there, right? Everything you're putting out there on your social media channels, if you're do, doing paid advertising or you're doing profiles with different publications, you know, people will find these things and they will reference them and they will do research before they want to do business with you. And you have to have a consistent message. And to me, user trust is built not only through explicit messaging about what your terms of service are and what your security controls are, but it's really, credibility, right, that you build in the marketplace is when you say something, is it true, right? Do your leaders come across as authentic? Is your advertising, you know, sort of appropriate and does it resonate with people? So I think to me, it is a really full, full frontal effect. Like you have to do it on all channels and you have to be consistent and you have to actually, it has to be true, right? So when, when we measure things for my team at Dropbox, we do brand favorability as a general, like sort of very high level metric where we are doing surveys out in the marketplace um, actually quarterly to just what, what do people think of the of Dropbox as a brand and one of the questions is do you trust this brand and it's a little bit of an open-ended question because we're not saying do we have the best security controls and the most security engineers and is do we do a bug bounty program we're actually asking about just general favorability and trust and we will get a lot of feedback from that right and we might have to tweak some things and and put some kind of messaging more at the forefront um but general i think it's really an overall effect about how you show up in in, in the market yeah i think that that's absolutely true and we see it time and time again i think uh, so Jed, in blockchain, we're still, uh, I, I hate calling this, technolo this technology nascent, but everybody does. So I'll say we're nascent. I like to say we're kind of past that stage, but it's still, um, we haven't created that critical mass yet. 
Uh, and I think we may be just reaching that state where we can achieve some network effects. But so how do we go about creating that critical mass on blockchain? Yeah, um, so I mean, I think it's not that different than a lot of other industries and a lot of other, um, you know, new technology, but basically, uh, you know, for a long time, blockchain was like, or, you know, blockchain applications were like super technical and, and not really consumer focused. And they were mainly a lot, very inward looking, like, I mean, the people that were interested in this stuff were, were very tech savvy and, and liked it for various reasons, but they didn't take a view of like how we get this out to, to you know, people who just don't actually care about this, uh, the technology, they just wanted to do something useful, right? And so I think that's a big piece of it is just like starting to focus more on, on the end user and like how people are actually gonna use this in the world and making it super simple and not, not relying on the fact that it's this shiny new thing, but like actually making it useful for people. And then also kind of like what I was mentioning before is that, that uh, all of it really depends on, on a certain critical mass of people. And like, there needs to be some way to bridge from like zero to, to like, you know, whatever the number of people it needs to be to make these things actually useful in the world. Because, uh, you know, all, like all the applications of, of like this blockchain type technology that I know of depend on a certain set of people using it, right? And so, and so I think that's been the big challenge and that's what needs to be, we need to figure out how to overcome that to be able to like get to the next stage essentially. And then, Ronaldo, when we're talking about uh, growing and scaling, I think that most of us want to do it in a way that's sustainable, but also ethical. Um, so what would, how should we be considering to do that? Uh, there is a number of factors, Danielle, but for instance, I've been working quite a lot in the digital ID uh, formats and ideas for the past like four years. And I think there's a huge market for KYC, so know your customer. And basically, uh, if you think about it, state government uh, issued IDs sometimes are flawed or inefficient or very confusing, and they do not scale or are not appropriate for using online environments and next generation services. So I, I really think one of the problems we need to crack uh, for the world going forward is precisely how to build better online ID systems. And I think that plugs directly into the possibilities of blockchain enabled services. So uh, there, there are so many uh, theoretical and practical uses that can be amplified if we solve, for instance, the, the KYC problem in a very smooth way and a way that, that is portable from country to country. And I, I really find this fascinating. And, and, and there are so many different levels you can do that from centralized models, uh, which is basically the, the traditional way we approach this, to self-sovereign identities that are completed, completely distributed and rely on DIDs, uh, decentralized identifiers and so on. So I find this debate fascinating because I think this is one of the ways we can amplify and build uh, more reliable, ethical, and auditable and transparent applications. So this is one of the ways I think uh, we can approach this. There, there are so many others, but I'm, I don't think we have the time to, to talk about all of them. And in terms of using policy and compliance, and uh, you know, a lot of times policy and compliance, they're not designed to, be in, to, to, to make network effects hard, but sometimes they end up doing that. So can we use policy and compliance to encourage network effects without discouraging uh, participation? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of regulatory sandboxes. So there are many regulators around the world that are very favorable to innovation. And if you are a regulator and you are watching this, this is how you should be. You should be pro-innovation. And uh, basically, I think you, you should not be afraid of new models and new services. And there are ways you can build like uh, institutional frameworks that can be pro-innovation and approach the, the next generation services in a positive way. And I've seen this happening uh, in the developing world quite a lot. Uh, the, the Brazilian Securities Commission, for instance, has been really pro-innovation. The Brazilian Central Bank has been very much pro-innovation. And I think you can build the institutional spaces uh, you need for that in the regulatory uh, side of it. And, and I've been seeing that quite a lot. And I think that that brings some optimism to the table. 
Yeah, I love what Brazil has done, certainly with the focus on the internet um, and, and just the forward thinking that those the legislators have put forward there. Okay, Keith, really important question here. What industries do you think can perform especially well with on blockchain? Oh, wow. Uh, you say the hard, hardest possible question. If I knew the answer to that, I could actually get rich. Um, <laughs> I don't know anybody knows the actual answer. I mean, we're all waiting. I mean, the disadvantage of being a VC is uh, you don't really have like much control. And so you kind of wait possibly for people to come to you with ideas. And then hopefully they resonate with you. But basically, you're very derivative, which is not a great place to be in life with what other ideas other people have and other things people want to chase. So one of the interesting things is when founders get very excited about, let's say climate change or something, then we can fund it, but we can't really propel ideas without founders being interested. So, you know, we've been sitting in the founders fund. We basically mostly funded, uh, we've actually mostly decided to buy crypto directly because we haven't actually seen too many, there's some exceptions, but we haven't really seen, too many specific applications that we felt were unique to crypto. And so we'd rather just basically buy, you know, the crypto directly. And um, that's, that actually suggests a lack of um, ideas um, in, in some ways and somewhat depressing, but we, we can change our mind tomorrow as soon as the right founder walks in with the vision. But I haven't really seen anything that's incredibly compelling to me yet. Okay, well, that puts a lot out there for people to start thinking about what they need to do to make it compelling to you. That's what I like. Well, it doesn't um, have to be to me, but uh, at least one of my partners would be great. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, all right, Jed. So just focusing on an open network and the, and the there's a lot of um, uh, challenge sometimes around open source and people understanding open source. And so our network effects in that they can lead to natural monopolies sometimes, we saw that on the web. Um, antithetical to open source? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so I, I think, I think you know, monopolies definitely are kind of antithetical to, to you know, innovation and like, and decentralization essentially. Uh, but I think that's why it's so important to make, to make these things as an open network, like uh, as, as like, I mean, this is why Stellar is a, is a nonprofit and, and we want the, the software to be owned by the world and, and and be like developed in the open things like this right i think because it would form the foundation of of of, of this network that other people can build on like for instance like if, if you wanted to make venmo today say if you want to make a venmo what you would have to do is compete with with venmo or these other payment applications and you'd have to build this huge user base of, of people to even be useful at all like the, no one would want to use your thing otherwise but if there's something like stellar existed where it was kind of this universal payment network where anyone could plug into it, then what you would be doing is just building an interface into that thing. And, and you, then you, you're kind of competing at this different level in the same way once the internet was made, uh, you know, you didn't have to co compete with like these recording industries. You could just put your music out there, like things like that, right? It just kind of, it, 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 um, it breaks the existing monopolies that, that are out there when you have this open network that anyone can use. And that, that's kind of the same thing that we're doing for payments, right? Which is why it's super exciting to me. and. And, and so although, yeah, it's true that, yeah, if, if, if we owned the network and we were this, you know, if we were like, I, I, I don't know, like, you know, some big company or something and just, and wanted to like charge rent to like access this network we're making, then yeah, it wouldn't really make sense. But, but this is what, again, why it's like important for this to be this open neutral thing that anyone can kind of build on. And then I think it like enables uh, just much more decentralization and innovation essentially, so. And, and sometimes I think that the open network um, it takes, it's, it's harder to get traction because you're not actually um, forcing people to go through the same things to get on and, um, or sometimes paying them to come on. So um, what do we need to do? Um, and Keith, if, if it's okay, I'll start with you in the short, medium and long term to reach network effects on an open network. Like what do we, how do we need to think about that from an open network standpoint? You're muted. You're muted, Keith. <laughs> that is a mistake. Okay, so um, historically, there's a couple of tactics that people have used to solve this. So Jed's point earlier is the critical one, which is until you have some density or you know some minimum viable uh, volume or practical uh, sufficient nodes or something, 
the network effects basically can't kick in. So what people sometimes do is they literally hack the system and they create that handcraft that first, you know, sort of set of users, uh, curate it, you know, the Y, the y Combinator advice to this is do things that don't scale, but you basically have to get there, you know, period. And then you hope that the network effects kick in afterwards and that you can withdraw whatever things that you're doing by hand that just don't scale. That's one set of tactics. Another, another way that's kind of worked is you basically have to create a single player mode um, that you know, has value for me if there's nobody else that used the product. And then over time, the values associated with other people using the product amplify the initial reason I adopted the product. So for example, you know, I'll give you a silly example, but maybe it's clear enough, is I, I have this app I use that tracks people's workouts. And it basically shows you what workouts you're doing. Um, and it gives you some information that is useful to me. It also shows me what my friends' workouts are. Truthfully, like unless I had value in it initially and it helped me schedule my workouts, plan my workouts, reserve my workouts, I wouldn't have adopted it because of course none of my friends were using it. Once all my friends in San Francisco started using it, then, then I use it mostly to look up what workouts they're doing and see if I want to join them for a workout. So it's mostly a social feature, but it never could have become a social feature for you know the hundred or so people that I occasionally go to a workout with unless it had unique value to me initially. So you kind of have to sometimes start with a vision of just how is this a single player game and then over time switch the prioritization. Yeah, that's great. For me, if those workout things, I just want to compete with my friends. So I'm glad that you that actually works. want to join them for the workout. <laughs> I mean, it's nice that you guys are working same, out so it's, much. It's, it's, the, it's the same thing, competing and joining <laughs> to me are the exact same. Um, Lynn, what do you think about the on, on an open network and network effects? Yeah, I mean, everything that's been said really resonates. And because I come at it from a communications and marketing point of view, I think there is something about, you know, just making sure at, to, to engage that critical mass, it really is about awareness, right? And I think using influencers in the right way where you have power users and really they're able to, to convince and really influence, that's why they're called influencers so much. So, it, it, you know, I've seen paying certain influencers to be ambassadors, so to speak, or incentivizing somehow actually can be really helpful to gain that critical mass. I think over time as you scale and the network effects are kicking in. It really is about how do you make sure that there is engagement and collaboration. And like you just illustrated, Keith, it is that social aspect, right? So there's a community that needs to be created and that I, I think has staying power. Um, so it is a community of use cases where you, the single player use, that speaks to me very well because if you can give both, that is the best of both worlds, right? If you can engage someone on a product or a service where there is value to them, like storing your things in Dropbox, right? Um, but also being able to share and collaborate in certain features and products within the Dropbox and building this very robust ecosystem around you is going to give people staying power and it's really just going to hopefully exponentially grow that. Yeah, I think the ecosystem play is something that's really important. And certainly that's what we're trying to do with the Stellar ecosystem. Ronaldo, if you think about network effects and you think about ge geographic diversity and the challenges on an open network, how do you see that? Uh, one thing that uh, I find important is UX, so the user experience, how to make it uh, very clear, transparent, easy to approach, uh, especially if you want to build a massive uh, product, you have to, to, to be able to design it in a way that is uh, useful for those uh, who are educated, who are like sophisticated, but also for those who lack education, or come from a, a very different uh, background in which they don't have much connectivity and so on. So I think UX is one of the, the, the key points that we, we can think. And of course, I think the beauty of open source is precisely that you can invite so many different uh, approaches uh, of people that can actually solve uh, that particular issue. So it's not a one size fits all, but it's basically uh, a way that you can approach it from different angles and from different needs. And of course, partnering with uh, some of the, the, the key players or the thought and market leaders in order to do that, I think is very helpful to achieve it. Yeah, I think that UX is such an important piece of this. I think if we, and I, we've learned this lesson, I think with respect to blockchain, 
making it simple and not making it about the technology is a huge way to get people to use it. Um, so Jed, one of the things that I think we've learned is that um, people are mostly okay with the status quo, um, or they just don't know that there's something better out there. And so how do we move this kind of technology, the one that you've built, the one that we're trying to push through into more of the mainstream, knowing that people don't always know that they need something better? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think people are largely okay with the status quo in some places where in other places they're definitely not. Right. And I think this is one of the reasons why Stellar is focused so much on the developing world is because, you know, when you go to places like Nigeria, you know, 60% of the people don't have bank accounts, they depend really heavily on remittances and they get charged a tremendous amount for that. And people are not okay with that status quo or like in, in, in Argentina where the currency deflates or inflates and, 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 you know, everyone's value kind of gets washed away that people are not okay with that situation and, and they're trying to look for solutions. Right. So, so to the extent we can, we can have stuff built on Stellar that's helping those set of people, it's just a much easier. Like when we would go and explain Stellar to people in the US, they always, their, their, their immediate thing is, well, why don't you just use PayPal? Or why don't you just do this, like yada, yada, yada. And, and, but when we go and explain it to people in like these developing world countries, they get it instantly and they think this is an amazing idea and they want it now, right? So I, I think you have to like pick the people who are having the greatest amount of pain and like build your things there. So, so there's the, this, there's not as much, activation energy that you have to go over to like go like get them off the status quo so that's kind of been our approach so far so and so when you first founded stellar and built stellar is that sort of the the idea when you're looking at the open network to gain adoption by focusing on these the, the these regions where there is significantly more pain yeah i mean it, it, it's kind of like twofold like it, it it for one thing it like helps those people the most so it seems like the most compelling thing to do and it also it also like has the greatest chance of like making this thing actually work and getting wider adoption. Cause like once it's working in these regions, then it's easier to spread to other regions that need it maybe less than them. But ultimately the whole world would be better off if they used it, right? So. Um, okay, Lynn, we have a question that uh, someone submitted uh, for you. To, the, to what extent does this idea of trust marketing mm. need to be local to a uh, ge geography or a region? Or is trust in one market transferable to trust in another market? It is a great question, and it's something that I think about quite a bit in my current position because I do think it's regional and local. But you got you have to start out with the same sort of values, and I would say one tip I always have for any kind of marketing and communications work you do is really it, it has to be consistent because there is something called Google Translate, and there are there is something called the internet, so you can find you know an Australian um, English language paper uh, paper or Japanese is going to be online. And, and so people read these things, right? Um, so I think you can start out with some key points that are very universal. But then when I think about how you, how you run a brand marketing campaign or any kind of campaign, it has to be localized. And therein lies some of the budgeting problems because it can't be, we just launched a top of funnel brand marketing campaign last week in the US here, right? It's very expensive to produce. It takes a long time to be creative. It's all done during COVID. And in order to do that, let's say in Germany or in France or in um, Japan, where we have offices, it, it takes actually sort of a reworking of that. You can't just translate it, right? And when you think about Europe, the regulatory environment is actually quite different and more strict, right? So they're much more advanced, you could say, or strict, conservative, whatever you want to call it, but you do have other considerations there. And there's a different skepticism toward tech in each country, um, the cloud in general. So I think you really do have to speak to the local issues and be very tonally sort of appropriate. If you think about it, a country like Japan, right? There's different cultural phenomenon that are taking place there and the in-person meetings, et cetera. So when you're running these kinds of campaigns, I think the trust and the credibility that you show should be regionalized and localized. But, but again, you got to start with the same sort of universal messaging and thought and then sort of tailor it to each place you go to, which that would be my recommendation. And, and I think Keith, Can just based on, oh, oh, sure. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, Renata. So I agree with Lynn and I think uh, most people are basically trapped in their trust bubble that is local. But one of the things that I think is happening is that technology and especially blockchain is uh, allowing trust to be exported. And actually, I think this is one of the most exciting things. So one example, I think, is the initiative by the government of Estonia that basically mm. created a very sophisticated uh, public service system and uh, based on a digital ID. And they're actually exporting uh, their government for anyone willing to become a Estonian e-citizen. 
So basically, if you're not happy with the way that your country operates, you can become a, a e citizen of Estonia. And of course, this is a, a pretty small experiment, but I think uh, it points into the direction we are going. So if you're not happy with the financial system in Brazil, maybe in the future you'll be able to basically opt in for a different model. And I think uh, that's what technology is doing. It's basically making trust an exportable thing. And I think that's a good thing to do. That's fascinating. Estonia is always moving in interesting directions, yes. particularly with like IDs and like just mm -hmm. different pieces. What I was going to ask Keith was with Open Door, did you find that even within the United States, like that there were different places that it was hard to gain that trust from users depending on, um, on, on, on how you messaged? We were able to sort of use metrics from one geo and translate to another. And I think you can do this internationally as well. So for example, classically in payments or financial services, volume, just gross merchandise volume, you know, something like that, payment volume is a metric that people look to for uh, proof of credibility. And so if you're processing billions and billions of dollars and you go to a new geo, presumably that means that you're doing some things well and it's reliable. So for example, if we went to a new, pick a, a city, um, let's say Sacramento, and we were launching in Sacramento where really no one had heard of Open Door and no one had read the media coverage. We, we could talk about the, you know, prof, uh, buying five, four or 5% of all the houses in Phoenix. Um, like, you know, or the most popular way to buy, actually a better framing truthfully was the most popular way to buy or sell a house in Dallas and Phoenix, the number one agent in pick your geo Durham or something like that. And that stuff does translate. Um, and I think so if you have, whatever the right metrics are for your business, you may be able to, uh, you know, use some of them to infer credibility in a, in a geo that's not yet acclimated to you. Oh yeah. I love that. We um, have uh, time for some questions. I, I have a few that I'm going to go through, but if you have any other questions, we only have a few more minutes left. So I'd love to submit them. Okay. So here's a question for anyone who wants to take it. Uh, do you think blockchain will increase the innovation of video game industries with donations, subscriptions, models like Twitch? Anyone? I can speak to that uh, quickly. Uh, it will, uh, and not only video games, like streaming services. If you look into China, for instance, right now, uh, it's amazing how people basically are doing uh, streaming as a way of doing market sales and also of monetizing uh, their time online and asking for uh, micro payments. So uh, if you establish an infrastructure for micro payments that is cost effective, that changes everything because uh, sending uh, $100 is one thing. It's being capable of sending one cent of a dollar or even a smaller fraction of that, it changes it all. So basically, especially for entertainment, and if you think about games, uh, most of the, the bigger ones now, they have their own currencies online. And basically this is one of the, the most valuable assets that a video game can have right now. So uh, there are so many ways that I think uh, platforms like Stellar can contribute either by consolidating and building cross platform currencies or being capable of basically doing and handling micropayments. So for me, this is really exciting. And I think we are really in the initial steps of very uh, interesting possibilities. Well, I love that. And I feel like what we have gotten to is this idea. We've learned so much from all of you this morning. Thank you guys from all of, for all your different backgrounds and perspectives on um, how we can achieve the network effects. It's something that's important for every industry. It's frankly, it's important for every business to think about. It's very rare for a business to be able to sit in its own space and not have to rely on uh, the network effects model because um, it's just, it permeates through almost everything we do. So thank you for so, so much for all of your time. And for those of you out there that, um, that came to, to watch, thank you for that as well. And, uh, and more to come on these topics in the future. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye, Danielle. Thanks. Bye. Bye.